third time presenting at this and I love it every time I get to come here. It's a great joy to present on what is my favorite severe weather event of 2017, the six tornadoes we had of May 24th. So what happened on that event? Well, if I could retitle it, I might go with Never Trust a Surface Low in May because they're, uh, they're a bit of a problem. Let me explain what happened on that day. We had six tornadoes, four EF0s, two EF2s, that developed on the northeastern periphery of an area of surface low pressure. So that's pretty much the event, if there's any questions. I, <laughs> all right, all right, I guess I should explain a little more why we're concerned about surface lows. To say the least, our office is acutely aware of the problems that can occur when you have surface low pressure that develops, especially in the springtime, when you have an increasingly unstable air mass. And what happened on this case in advance of the surface low, on the eastern periphery we had a southerly flow that was helping to increase temperatures into the mid-60s. And as that was occurring, we also had dew points, moisture that was coming into the area and increasing also to around 60 degrees. Moisture, humidity, and heat, these are things that go into developing instability out of a thunderstorm, and that's something we're concerned about. We also had an area of convergence and not only that, but a gradient developed in the, in the moisture, the heat, and areas that had less of it. We developed a front, basically, in the vicinity of this area of surface low pressure. And this front, of course, can act as a source of lift, a source of focus for thunderstorms to develop. So there's another little factor that's going to help things develop in this event. But as we know, surface low pressure systems also have an impact on the wind fields in the atmosphere, especially very close to the ground, the area we're looking at in Ohio, here where the winds are out of the east, which is very interesting and very important, because when we go just a little bit off the ground, those winds are now out of the southeast, and when we go just a little bit further off the ground, those winds are now screaming out of the south. That's a lot of directional turning in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. We have quite a bit of wind shear, which is a big concern. When you have wind shear and you have developing heat and humidity, maybe you end up in a situation where tornadoes can develop. And not only that, I'm going to jump up to the upper levels of the atmosphere where we have a strong jet that's just to the east of the area. And actually, our part of the country is in an area where there's a lot of divergence up in the upper levels of the atmosphere. We're actually in the left exit region of this strong upper jet, which means the forcing, the lift in the atmosphere is going to be enhanced even further. So there's a lot of things going on, but it is still kind of a conditional threat. And the reason for that is because you have a very small area right ahead of that area of low pressure where things may occur. But our confidence began to increase in the potential for this event causing some problems. And that morning, the email we sent out to our emergency management partners indicated the potential for tornadoes. Our hazardous weather outlook issued that afternoon. Also, we wanted to get the word out that there was some potential for tornadoes. And a little later that afternoon, I think I was probably just sitting at home editing pictures to put up on Twitter or something, and I got a phone call from the office, and they said, well, why don't you come on in and help us watch the radar? We think something might happen. So I said, of course, I would be happy to do so. So at 6.30 p.m., I came into the office, and at this point, we didn't have anything going on quite yet. But let me show you an overview of what we're looking at through the first half of this event. Lots and lots of precipitation had developed in the area, most of it moving from south to north. A lot of this as a result of that large area of favorable lift being in the correct position with respect to the upper jet stream. And that large area of favorable lift created lots of showers and thunderstorms, but we're also focusing on this area where you have a little bit more uh, convergence, a little bit more focused thunderstorm development, which actually led to some flash flooding in the Cincinnati area from this event. That's a whole other presentation somebody else can give some other time. We're going to talk about these cells that developed just ahead of the surface low, just ahead of that band, that line of storms, these little mini supercells that developed in an increasingly favorable air mass, an air mass that was very very volatile and was quickly changing. Now how might we measure an air mass that's changing? The good news is right about the time those cells were developing in the Wilmington area, we released our evening weather balloon. 
Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we found from that sounding near the end of the presentation, but to say the least, one of the first things we keyed in on was the wind fields that we saw on that day with a significant amount of turning, a significant amount of directional shear in the low levels of the atmosphere, which is something that we know tornadoes need to develop. And we were expecting that might be the case on this day. But sometimes you just gotta go outside and take a look at what's going on with your own eyes. So a short time later after the balloon went up, I wanted to take a look at what this cell, this developing cell to the northwest of Wilmington looked like. And when I went outside, this is what I saw a developing wall cloud. Actually a pretty good looking wall cloud if you ask me. And this is probably about the time we realize, okay, in this environment, every one of these little showers that's developing is probably going to have a wall cloud attached to it. Which means at the very least the phones are going to start getting busy and certainly we're probably going to start getting busy when they start doing something. And about 20 minutes later, I decided, well, I'm going to take a look at these showers that are developing to the east of our office, because maybe they're going to have something that we're going to want to look at also. So I take a look out the window, and we have a couple more features. This one, which was a little bit to the north, was a shower that didn't end up doing anything, but, I mean, that's an interesting feature with the tilted base and a lowering, and I'm going to jump to the one to the south, because this one is even better. Is this Ohio? Is, is this yeah. look like a, a storm you find in Ohio? I mean, at this point, it's barely producing any precipitation, but you definitely have that lowered base, the tilted updraft, things you find in a sheared environment, and we're going to come back to this cell, I promise you that. But, to start this off, we're going to go back to the one I looked at first, and about 20 minutes after I looked at that cell, well, we have some eyewitnesses on the ground that might have seen what was going on. And from here on out in this presentation, there's going to be a lot of pictures and videos received from eyewitnesses. Some of these did come into us in the first couple of days after this event occurred. A lot of them did not. A lot of them I only found in the past month when I was putting this together. But we're going to use that information to try and piece together the history of what happened with all of these tornadoes and maybe even rewrite the record books a little bit, make some changes if we find some new things we didn't know about at the time. Our first eyewitness from near the interchange of I-71 and Ohio State Route 73, looking to the northwest, that cell that I had just seen a wall cloud on 20 minutes earlier was now doing a little bit more than that. <laughs> Quite interesting that we now basically have video evidence of a tornado occurring. But in addition to that, we also have another person who was a little bit closer, a little bit closer to that tornado as it was developing. And in fact, the video they shot pretty much was able to watch it as it touched down. And now I asked this person when I got their video, well, when exactly did you take this video? And they told me 7.47 p.m. is when I took this video. Now I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Now let's listen in. I read the TV, what's it saying? It's just saying flash flood warning, that's it. Nothing else. Flash flood warning, that's it. Who's working the radar at Wilmington? Okay, all right. So it's me, unfortunately. So here's what we know happened. We did confirm a tornado based on the videos that we had seen at the time, but we thought it had occurred at about 7.55 p.m., a little further to the north than where it actually occurred, but we now have video and it was not just the, the person further to the north, but one of the people near the interstate also said 7.47 p.m. is when this happened. So we had to kind of readjust, look at the radar, and try to figure out where was this when it happened. We have video evidence that it occurred, and in reality, it probably wasn't up where we thought it was. It was maybe a couple miles to the south, which would put that tornado in an interesting spot, because we did drive around where we thought it was, look for damage, couldn't find anything, well, it turns out it probably actually occurred near the north end of Caesar Creek Lake, which means our damage survey would have been better off having a boat to look for it, which unfortunately we don't have access to. So, well, we just do the best we can. So chances are it looks like that tornado is going to be shifted earlier, eight minutes in time, unfortunately before that warning went out. But these are things you learn after the fact. Now, why might we not have issued a warning on the cell when it looked like this? Well, um, there's a great looking circulation there, if anybody can find it. And there isn't, so I can't. 
If I jump a little bit higher in elevation from our radar to get some of the noise out of the way, we actually can see there is some semblance of a circulation, and you can probably imply there's some semblance of a hook echo on the reflectivity on the left side as well from this developing mini supercell, which at this point is really kind of more just a shower that happens to be producing a tornado than anything else. Now, as it continued forward in time, it does start to show a little bit better circulation. At 7.55 is when I issued the tornado warning for it. The first tornado warning issued on this particular cell, it would not be the last, I promise you that. But shortly after the warning was issued, we didn't have any further touchdowns for a while. So, let's move on ahead as we go towards the second tornado of the day. As that cell is now in Greene County, Ohio, we have issued another tornado warning on it as it's moving north. And yes, it's always a good day when you get to include the word Xenia in one of the tornado warnings. <laughs> so, let's, so let's take a look here. As at 8.23 p.m., as we're watching this on our radar, and we're seeing some signs of circulation, um, we get a spotter report from near Spring Valley from a spotter who's reporting a rotating wall cloud. So I think, yes, having that warning out is a good idea as this storm continues its north to north-northwestward progression. And we go a little bit further ahead, the hook echo becomes a little better defined. There is some sign of circulation there. We believe at 8.26 p.m. that the second tornado of the day touched down. Now, we call this the Beaver Creek Township Tornado because most of its path was in Beaver Creek Township, but it's very close to Xenia. So if I throw the Xenia city limits on the map and we take a closer look, wow, the first damage our survey found was here on Colorado Drive. That is within the city limits of Xenia. And if you look at this damage that occurred, I mean, all I can say is it's, it is my great honor and privilege to present on the Great Xenia Tornado of 2017. Okay, this is Xenia. They've done this a few times before. Uh, they don't have to handle this sort of thing. Now that tornado, just a couple minutes later, managed to go very close to the KI-19 Greene County Airport, which has an AWOS. How close was the tornado from hitting the AWOS? Probably about 500 feet or so. And the wind measurements were interesting. Before the tornado went by, we had that easterly flow, like we talked about earlier. <laughs> then the tornado passes by and switches to west-southwest of 15 gusts to 24 knots. And then when it's done, we go back to the southeast again. That's a heck of a wind shift. I wonder if there's something going on near there at the time. So that storm continues north, and at about 8.30 p.m., it's at its maturity. It's probably at its best-looking, strongest state as it's crossing US 35 on the west side of Xenia. And we've got some eyewitnesses to help us out with this one. First, this picture, which was taken from, from a video. As a, as a storm, this is from the Bellbrook Road uh, inter interchange with US 35, as it goes to the north. And we've even got someone a little closer on the west side of Xenia, looking a little closer to it and actually driving towards it. Look at it, look at it. <laughs> Yes, that's it. That's it right there. So, and another picture from somebody just about a half mile to the north, at least a good view of the wall cloud, partially obscured by some trees there. But we know there's something going on. We'll go to 8.33 p.m. This is actually starting to look halfway decent on our radar for you know the, the type of tornado that it produced. And a, a spotter on the north side of Xenia is still witnessing this lowering as it's, as it's moving north. So let's put all these pieces together for our second tornado of the day. And we're gonna start out with the damage that occurred down in the Xenia city limits. We've got eyewitnesses seeing this tornado from multiple different locations. We've got the AWOS there from the airport measuring that shift in the winds. And we actually did have a few sporadic damage reports, reports further north along the track. And we measured this to be estimated about 8.26 p.m. to 8.34 p.m. for our second tornado of the day. So let's go to a little place called Okta. It's near Jeffersonville. If you've never heard of Okta, that's okay. There's not much there. But on this day, everything was going on in Okta. That shower that I was looking at on the east side of Wilmington with that great tilted updraft and the lowering, well, it's starting to become a little bit more interesting. And that's the one on the right we're going to look at. Riding the fake Green County line, 
Greene County was a busy place this night too. And I wasn't the only weather service person taking a look at this storm. From somebody on the way back to Wilmington, it's the Ohio River Forecast Center's Jeff Myers, who was watching as a funnel cloud developed out of this cell, which now looks a whole heck of a lot better than when it already looked kind of impressive from what I saw it about a half hour earlier. And that's not too bad looking right there. So given what's happened so far in the event, at this point I'm just like, all right, all right, forget about it. We're just going to get that, we're just going to get the warning out. 8.27 p.m. The question is, did I get it out in time? Did I do it in time this time? And thankfully, we have somebody watching the touchdown who's going to have to answer that question for us. Okay, so that's going to be about the, probably, as the crow flies, probably three miles before we sit. There it goes. And that's the warning going out as it's touching down. As it's touching down. So I came in just under the wire, just under the wire. And I think, because I think my boss is in the audience, we're going to say, yes, I got that one. And a couple minutes later, as it continues north, and now it looks, you know, kind of, kind of decent. Kind of decent for the type of tornado we were dealing with on this day anyway. So the question is, on the radar, what are you seeing here? What's the dominant feature on this radar image from, this, uh, from where this tornado was occurring? And you're probably looking at the bright colors there. They're actually an indication of Interstate 71 because our radar is actually picking up the cars moving up and down I-71, which are moving a whole heck of a lot faster than any winds that tornado is producing. <laughs> but if we measure it out, we actually do have some inbound, some outbound, producing a rotational velocity of about 10 knots. There is no tornado warning guidance out there that says when you get 10 knots, you issue a tornado warning because that's really, really weak. But on this day, and in some days like this, you just have to recalibrate yourself and kind of go with the flow. If that's what's making tornadoes, then that's what you issue warnings for. As this tornado is basically crossing the Green County and Fayette County line, and also probably as it's coming close to crossing Interstate 71, we've got another video from another spotter in the area. Now, we believe the tornado crossed I-71. We actually don't have any video of it crossing the interstate. I mean, is it possible that people were actually driving instead of like playing around on their phones while it was going down the interstate? I don't know. It's, it's a nice thought, um, but, but we actually don't have video of it as it was crossing the interstate. But we do think that happened. And as we continue a little further on, the hook echo is I mean, we're talking pretty weak, but the shape is nice anyway. The circulation, you're still right around that 10 knot range, and it's not very strong. And so we've got another witness who is kind of a little bit behind the storm, maybe a little bit late from what he might want to see, but let's take a look at what he's got. About four minutes ago, this cell right here dropped a, dropped a huge wedge tornado on the ground. <laughs> 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 So right about this time also, we got another report. A tweet was forwarded to us from a, a Twitter user named at PFT Commenter. And I'm not sure what language this tweet is speaking, but it was very confusing to us. But, uh, man, it got some attention. Over 3,000 likes. That's a, that's a lot of activity on this tweet. And this guy's buddy, at Barstool Big Cat, actually reported a video. Storm chasing. Big Cat All right, here we go. All right, here we go, folks. This here is a tornado. <laughs> I'll make sure you heard this guy. Alright, here we go. Alright, here we go, folks. This here is a tornado. That looks like an EMP tornado. Alright, here we go. Alright, here we go, folks. This here is a tornado. That looks like an EF2 on the Vegeta scale. At this point, we're just befuddled. We're we don't know what this is about. We don't know what's going on here. So we ask for help. Can you? Where, where are you? What are you looking at? Where are you looking? And here's the reply we get. <laughs> Who are these people? It turns out 
it turns out these guys are, are, are part of a, a very popular social media football um, enterprise. These guys were so popular, they actually got a show on ESPN that was canceled after one episode uh, for body and offensive sports commentary. Well, this is a, a family event, so I'm not going to go further into the history of these guys, but I think I know the real reason their show was canceled. Because that's not an EF2. <laughs> Any scale. <laughs> you know, so this storm moved further north. We had some help from people a little further away from spotters uh, on the north northbound on I or further north on I-71, relayed by Columbus meteorologist Ben Gelber and Cincinnati meteorologist Erica Kalura, who was down close to Wilmington, actually, was able to witness this tornado um, from, from, uh, from near uh, exit 50 uh, on the interstate. It was interesting to us that these tornadoes could be actually be seen from, from a pretty good distance away, and also how a lot of the reports that, that we received, the people I talked to just in the past month or so, let us know that they thought these tornadoes they were looking at were maybe very close to them, maybe in the next field over or just a mile or two over, and we put it on the map and look at the radar, and it was actually a pretty pretty good distance further than they had expected. It was interesting that, that it's difficult to estimate how far you are away from something like this. At 8.36 p.m., I think we're finally done with this tornado and with this cell in general. So here's what we've got. We've got those first two eyewitnesses watching it touch down, watching it probably cross the interstate. How can we extend this further? Thankfully, we had some eyewitness reports from a farm owner who was uh, close to the further on in that track, relayed to us by Andrew Buck Michael, another Columbus meteorologist, who gave us very, very good information. This tornado was at least intermittently on the ground as it continued to the north-northwest a little bit further than, than we would have thought otherwise. So we were able to make this determination, this tornado, from May 27 to 36 p.m., and now we're halfway done. Three down, and if you recall from the intro, three to go. So let's keep going with this storm in Greene County. This tornado warning has now been extended because we still are liking what we're seeing on the radar with this storm a little more than we were earlier. But as we continue northbound, um, we've seen this a few times before, right? Well, thankfully, thankfully, we have the terminal Doppler radar and it serves the Dayton Airport to help us out. So we're going to switch radars and we're going to take a look at this cell. And we've got an eyewitness and he's sitting right down here, Brian Wood, watching this storm. He says it's a rotating wall cloud and it's rotating well. We have the tornado warning out on it, so we're, we're good with that. We go a few minutes later, and he says it's rotating decently at this point. We go a few minutes later, and he says it's not rotating at all anymore. So, hmm, what are we going to do? At 8.56 p.m., I even comment on NWS chat that we're seeing a weakening trend. But you know what? We've had reports of rotation fairly recently. We know the storm's history. So let's keep it going just a little bit longer, and we'll keep this tornado warning going. At 9.01 p.m., we've got another person on the south side of Fairborn who's seeing a ragged wall cloud, not really seeing anything of much interest. Brian's got another picture for us, and I'll just give you his direct quote. It looked like crap. <laughs> Not much going on right now at 9.01 p.m. Things change very, very quickly in the coming minutes. At 9.05 p.m., the radar is looking interesting because that circulation is a little stronger than we've been seeing before, and that hook echo you see, that's in northwestern Greene County near Fairborn, and it's pretty pretty good looking. Well, we make a decision at this point. Let's extend this tornado warning onward at 9.05 p.m. Turns out that was a very good decision because at 9.06 p.m., well, let's go back to the eyewitnesses. And I don't need to draw an arrow for this one because this one was taken from pretty much right underneath the circulation. And we'll watch this from the Fairborn Fire Department, very close to downtown Fairborn, and you see the swirling in the sky. But now watch what happens closer to the ground. The trees, even the trees in the foreground, as they start to move, basically as this thing is, that, that rotating column of air we talk about in the spotter training, in contact with the cloud base and in contact with the ground, as that's occurring, probably no more than 500 feet from where this video was taken, as this video was taken. That's a little closer than I'd like to be. So let's back up a little further away to a tower cam near I-675 south of the base. Now this was a video that was provided by Eric Elwell from WHIO, and watch what happens right about there. Did you see it? Well, I'll screen capture it. So now you definitely can't see it. The Fairborn tornado, as it touches down, captured from many miles away. 
But we can go even closer than this because we've got another person on the east side of I-675 who is watching this not just as it's developing, but as it touches down near the Air Force Base. And you hear the glare of the sirens in the background and the strange lighting on the tornado as it reaches the ground. The bright lights from the Air Force Base actually lighting up the lower part of that tornado makes for a dramatic, dramatic look. Now, if the way that video look looks familiar, you might also be familiar with this picture that was provided by Jessica Dunn by way of Brian Wood. And this picture was tweeted out and it got quite a bit of attention because it's a pretty good picture. Now, I'm going to take a tangent for a second and talk a little bit about Twitter etiquette. There's a little button down here. It's called Retweet. When you click this button, it tops you up and lets you share this image with all of your followers. And you can even put a little message in there, like we did a little bit later, just to let people know this is a bad deal. You can share this picture with people. Don't right-click, save image as, and then, and then put the picture up there as if it were your own. Please don't do that. Retweet, retweet, that's the way to go. So, 9.07 p.m., we see the circulation strengthening. We have a spotter report from one of our amateur radio operators who believes he has seen the touchdown or has a report of the touchdown right pretty much where we thought it was. And obviously now we've got a bigger issue because this circulation is now strengthening, strengthening even further. This is definitely the best looking storm we've had on the day. The hook echo is strong, the circulation is strong. We have a 40 knot rotational velocity. If you remember the octa tornado had a 10 knot. So we're, we're four times the strength of that tornado on the, on the velocity. That doesn't necessarily mean the tornado's four times the strength, because it wasn't. But it's certainly a much better indication that a tornado is occurring at this time, as it's moving north of the Air Force Base and about to cross the line into Clark County, where we've got another picture <coughs> from another person on I-675 who is watching that tornado as it's going on the north side of Fairborn? But there's something else. There's something else in that picture. You might notice the wall cloud that's developed separately from the tornado off to the right, off to the north. And as I show on that radar image there, you're looking to the north. You have two circulations developing. What's going on here? Is this something we should be concerned about? Let's jump a little bit further ahead in time. And at 9.16 p.m., we think that Fairborn tornado lifted. And certainly, we're going to come back to the whatever that is going on further to the north. So let's take a breakdown of the Fairborn tornado. We said it was from 9.07 p.m. to 9.16 p.m. based on some of the pictures we had seen, the damage reports that we had a little further along on the track, including some of which we surveyed. Based on the video we got from the Fairborn fire station, that picture that was relayed by Brian Wood that was taken at 9.06 p.m., we think we can probably take that tornado and adjust it just a little bit further south and a little bit earlier. We're going to go to 9.06 p.m. for the touchdown time on this one. And now we can look a little bit at this METAR observation that came in from the Air Force Base. You don't usually see a tornado 3 northeast moving to the north as a remark <laughs> in an observation on an official METAR, but in this case, that was probably completely legitimate. And now, some damage that occurred there. It was, this was an EF-0, remember? This was not a strong tornado, although the radar did look good. We had some damage in the park in the city of Fairborn, further north up on Osborne Road. Some more damage, including, as Brian was just telling me, a, a dock that was moved from the north to the south, which uh, certainly an indication that you had cross-flow winds as a result of the tornadic circulation. And we surveyed a trailer park just south of I-70, further on to the north, where we believe the tornado did its last damage before it pulled itself up and was all done. So if you remember that other circulation we were looking at, we're going to take a look at that now. These two images are matched up, so you can see the one circulation as the Fairborn tornado is lifting corresponds to the end of the track you see on the left side image in far southwestern <coughs> Clark County, Ohio. But what's going on up near Park Lane? We're going to go back to the tower cam and take another look. The one provided from WHIO and it's got a distant view, but watch and wait for it and wait for it and there, there. A power flash, a bright power flash from another tornado, the fifth of the day that is now touched down. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to plot the location of that tower cam on the map and the exact direction it's looking, the exact direction from that spot to the tornado. And now we're going to see if we can add another video from a little bit closer. This ODOT video from I-675 and I-70, which was also looking at the tornado as 
Yep. The whole thing lights up from the same power flash. So we'll do the same thing. We're going to plot that location on the map, and we're going to extend the direction of view towards where the circulation is located. I think we can do one more. And here's a video that was provided also by Eric Elwell from someone in Park Lane, someone a little bit closer. And boom, another power flash. And here, I'll screen capture that one so you can see it. It just lights the whole sky up, doesn't it? Well, this one was very close, but we can do the same thing. Look at its exact angle of motion. So now what we can do is take those three power flashes. It's actually the same power flash on three different videos from three, three very different perspectives. And take those locations and those directions of motion and plot them on the map and see what happens when we bring them. So you can see the direction that we were looking from all three of those videos, which crossed there, and I'm going to throw our tornado track that we surveyed on the map, and we've got right at the start where it occurred. Right in Park Lane where this tornado began. And so I think at this point we can pretty safely say that we had not one, but two tornadoes occurring, if not right at the exact same time, then very, very close to it. Two tornadoes from two circulations, from two separate hook echoes on the same supercell. I cannot think of a time, at least in our forecast area, that we've ever had a tornado producing two, or a supercell producing two different tornadoes at the exact same time. That kind of thing can happen, but I can't remember ever seeing it here in Ohio. Probably has at some point. But to see it on the radar with that kind of uh, clarity is, is really something. So the Park Lane tornado develops and starts to move to the north. At 9.18 p.m., we're going to switch views because our radar has come back online from its little uh, sojourn. And unfortunately, it started listening to Pink Floyd and dropping acid. <laughs> Unless you think that all of these storm cores have 90 dBZ, in which case you probably have the largest hail ever recorded. Well, I'm going to promise you this, despite the bad reflectivity image that we got from the first radar, from the first image back when our radar came online, that is a hook echo there, that is a hook echo, and we do have a circulation, and we do have a lowering in correlation coefficient, which means that our dual polarization radar is detecting debris in the air, a tornadic debris signature, we're five tornadoes into the event, and we finally get a tornadic debris signature to look at. I mean, it took long enough, but we'll, we'll take it. Not that we like what's going on, but it's nice to know what's going on for sure. And for the first time, we're able to continue the tornado warning, but also use enhanced warning that we have radar confirmation that this is doing damage. And that's very important. That enhances the messages that we put out. We'll go back to the terminal Doppler radar from Dayton and watch as this circulation and this hook echo and just, just look, at, look at the hook echo on the left first, the way it wraps up. That's some pretty <coughs> impressive imagery. Now on the right side, that circulation, that looks nothing like the Okta or Harveysburg tornadoes. That looks legitimate. That looks pretty significant. And this tornado, as, as you'll see in a minute, was our longest tracked tornado of the day. And we estimated about 9.32 p.m. that the tornado was done. And so what we've got is 916 to 932, that's a, the longest, not only in track, but in the amount of time it took, the longest tornado of the day where there was a lot of damage. We did rate EF1 on the Enhanced Fujita scale. Some commercial buildings in Park Lane, a lot of these were all over the news, so some of you might have seen them before. And then sporadic tree damage as that tornado continued to the north-northwest along its track. So we've got five tornadoes in, but as you know, there's one more to come. We have one final break. As that tornado is lifted, about 9.40 p.m., we extend the tornado warning again because this is still an impressive rotating supercell, and the terminal Doppler radar in Dayton decides it wants to go out of service right as the forward flank of the supercell is hitting it. Just a great time to have a radar go out of service. So we will switch back to our radar and take a little bit of a wider look. There's the supercell over Miami County now. It's still out ahead of that line. Now our thinking is once that line gets in and overtakes the supercell, which is probably going to happen fairly soon, your tornado threat's probably over. But until then, does it have time to produce one more? In Castown, Ohio, we do have evidence that it did. And the terminal Doppler radar in Dayton returned to service right as the hook echo was exiting the envelope of the radar. I don't know how the radar survived, but I'm very glad it did because it got us some pretty nice images going forward. 
And what I'm going to do here at 9.57 p.m. is actually go through a vertical loop of the radar where I'm going to not go forward in time but tilt up to higher slices of the supercell. And one thing that becomes evident very quickly is the shape and the structure of the supercell. The, the structure of the weak echo region where the updraft of the storm is located, that's that big break where you don't see the reds and oranges, you don't see the stronger reflectivities. That's actually the updraft of the storm. Look at the structure on this. If you took this, made it three times bigger, and dropped it in Kansas, you'd have, you'd have 600 little red spotter network dots trying to get underneath it to get video. But this is Ohio, so that doesn't happen here. It's also getting late. You go a little bit higher, and you've actually got a bounded weak echo region where the whole thing is wrapped around the updraft, which is very, very impressive. And to see it, how close are we to the radar? That storm core is literally like three or four or five miles from the radar site. And a radar that uses a higher resolution than our radar in Wilmington even. So to get those kind of images is really kind of interesting. At 10.03 p.m., as that hook echo is wrapped up even further, I'm going to zoom in on this. Because you see a lot of greens, you see a lot of reds, but it's this little thing right here that is the genesis of our sixth and final tornado of the day at the tip of that hook echo, where new rotation has developed and we actually do, despite it being late at night, we do have someone who has video of that. Tornado on the ground, right here. And through the power flashes, you can see it. Or probably uh, lightning strikes, but uh, you, you can see the tornado that has reached the ground. There's a still image there that shows you that. At the tip of that hook echo, a little bit northwest of Cass Town, Ohio. Now I'm going to go a little bit further forward in time, and that circulation strengthens. We believe that tornado and that hook echo, they wrap up again just like they've been doing all night. And we're kind of getting sick of seeing it, but that's what's going on. At 10.07 p.m., the terminal Doppler radar date goes out again. And so we have to switch back to our radar, where we see a circulation coincident with the core of the storm, or at least as far as we can tell from our radar, which is a long way away, but on the correlation coefficient, you do see evidence, certainly by 10.06 p.m., if, if not even there a little bit, and by 10.08 p.m., it's obvious that you do have debris being lofted by this tornado. So we do know this tornado is already on the ground at this point. And we continue that tornado warning, the last tornado warning issued on this supercell. So here's what we've got, though. You remember the times I just showed you? We confirmed the tornado based on some damage we surveyed up a little further to the northwest minor damage, um, some damage to homes was significant enough, we did have to rate this in EF1 on the, on the enhanced Vegeta scale, but we determined based on the circulations location, this occurred at 10.09 to 10.10 p.m. Problem is, we've got this video that shows the tornado on the ground from David Baxter, who was watching it and told me that video was taken at 10.03 p.m., which matches the radar location at the time that the tornado would have been down there. So, we know the tornado happened. We have evidence of it on video. So here's a little map of the circulation path that that, that that circulation took as that hook echo wrapped up. And so although no damage was observed through this area, we were at least able to extend this tornado track a little further and extend the time back from 10.09 to 10.03 as the start time of this tornado. These changes will all be eventually incorporated on our website and on storm data, but I literally finished this like two nights ago on midnight shift, so just give me a week or two and then I'll get it done. <laughs> so after that tornado was done, three hours later, I finally got to go home. There are no restaurants open in Wilmington at one in the morning, so frozen pizza it was. All right, that's the end of the event, but not the end of the presentation because I want you to see a few more things. This feature following Zoom, which follows this storm, Watch it, and watch the hook echoes develop, cycle out, develop, cycle out. Over the course of this video, which only shows three of the five tornadoes, Beaver Creek, Fairborn, and Park Lane, you can see that hook echo actually cycle four or five different times, and the circulation that you see on the right cycles four or five different times as new circulations develop, as old circulations die off, circle of life. That storm was born for over two hours consecutively, it's very rare to have a supercell. We have warnings out consecutively for two hours like that. But uh, on this day, that's what happened. That's what we were dealing with. Just let this finish playing through one more time. This prolific five tornado producing supercell finally met its fate when that line caught up to it. So let's go back to our sounding and figure out what was going on here. Why did we have this occurring? 
You remember this sounding was taken early in the event, close to the Harveysburg and Okta, the weaker tornadoes from the event. That's the environment we sample, favorable for tornadoes to develop, certainly. Um, and we'll throw the convective available potential energy on there. The CAPE, which was just under 1,000. And we're also looking at one thing, which is how much energy is there available to the storms in the lowest three kilometers of the atmosphere? And the answer to that question is that that's actually a pretty good percentage of it. The area you see in red on the graph is the lowest three kilometers close to the ground. In fact, the Cape is, if you want to put it this way, is fattest at that part of the sounding in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. It's very important because tornadoes like that. Tornadoes like when their vertical accelerations are very strong close to the ground. You know what else was strong close to the ground? The directional turning in the wind shear. These numbers may not be eye-popping for storm relative velocity, but we're going to show you what we can do to make them a little bit better. Because if you remember, this was taken early in the event. In an environment where we had winds out of the east-southeast and dew point depressions of about 5 to 7 degrees Fahrenheit, which means the relative humidities were fairly high, but not maxed out or anything. Now, we got weak tornadoes out of this environment, but what happened further north, where we got still, still weak tornadoes, but, but certainly better looking on radar and with more longevity further to the north, the winds were backed further to the east-northeast with more turning in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. And the dew point depression is three to four degrees. That means the relative humidities are higher, the cloud bases are lower, and because of that, that makes the potential for tornadoes even a little bit more significant. And so what we're able to do is take that sounding from our office and adjust it. We're gonna modify it. We're gonna change some things we're going to, to, to approximate the environment that produced the Fairborn and Park Lane tornadoes further north by increasing the relative humidity, lowering the temperature, which is the blue curve, and increasing the dew point, which is the green curve, to make the relative humidity higher. And on the right side, you also see we take those winds and we back them a little bit further. We're going to give stronger directional shear, especially in that lowest one to two kilometers of the atmosphere. And we can measure what kind of changes that we're doing on, on this now, this modified sounding that we believe is, is accurate for the area where the stronger tornadoes occurred. We can see that the wind shear through that zero to three kilometer layer, we're talking over 30 knots, which is, which is pretty good. The lapse rate of minus 6.7 was actually stronger, a steeper lapse rate than any of the computer models had indicated was going to happen on that day. The convective available potential energy low to the ground in that lowest three kilometers Again, stronger than anything it indicated, certainly stronger than our original sounding showed. And I'm also going to look at what was the pressure level in millibars at the height of that zero to three kilometer layer. We probably should have looked at that and said, Some, this is just not going to be our day. So, <laughs> so, so let's take that sounding and modify it. Those are the old numbers, but we've got a little bit more to work with now with the modified sounding. Cape now over a thousand. And we're looking at 20 to 25% of the energy in that sounding contained within the lowest three kilometers, which of course is also the part of the sounding where we have a significant amount of turning and wind shear in the atmosphere, which we now increase. The zero to one kilometer shear increases a little bit, but the zero to three kilometer shear or storm relative helicity is almost doubled, 99. 184. That's a big change. That's actually a, a really big change and, and tells you that it, these storms are moving into an environment that was already favorable but becoming even more favorable with respect to the winds and the lowest levels of the atmosphere. And so what we end up with is basically threading this mesoscale needle in an environment where there's unimpeded inflow with air moving from the east into these storms and not to mention just right thermodynamic conditions with the relative humidities increasing, low cloud bases, oh, and absolutely boatloads of low-level shear, which is something tornadoes like. And we're going to take this one supercell and basically run it straight through this mesoscale needle that we just threaded. Now, despite its prolificness, keep in mind, we were still dealing with weak tornadoes, EF0s and EF1s. This was not an environment that supported EF2s, EF3s, EF4s, and, and so on and so on, but it was prolific. It produced several of them in just a span of a few hours. And moving, as you may have noticed, in a very, very odd direction. When's the last time we had tornadoes moving from the southeast to the northwest? Does anybody know? Never. I, I hear never, and we're gonna prove that that's, at least as far as we know, true. 
As a proxy for tornadoes, I'm going to look at our warnings because our warnings have a little tag at the bottom, and that tag at the bottom tells you the direction and speed that the storm you have warned on is moving in. And I'm going to take all of those warnings that we have issued since that tag showed up and plot it on a windrows. That's from mid-2007 to 2017, 356 tornado warnings. What direction were the storms coming from? And the vast majority of storms were coming from the west-southwest to the east-northeast, a very climatologically favored direction for thunderstorms to move, especially for tornadic thunderstorms to move in. And I'm going to zoom in on the wind rows a little bit and show you that the 250-degree direction, which is the west-southwest from the wind direction, was responsible for 63 of the 356 tornado warnings we've issued in the last 10 years. And in fact, 78% of the tornado warnings we've issued were out of the southwest, west-southwest, or west, which is the area on this graph that I'm going to show in yellow. That's a vast majority, and that's also not what we're interested in with respect to this event. So I'm going to zoom in a little further on this wind rose and take a look at what's going on in the southeasterly quadrant of the wind rose. These tornado warnings, these few tornado warnings that we've issued out of a southeasterly to northwesterly wind direction, how many in that past 10 years have we issued in that direction? The answer is 10, and they were all in this event. We've literally never done it before, uh, so it's kind of, I guess it's kind of, kind of historic. And just using this one, the furthest along that graph, the 150 degree direction, which is really kind of a southeasterly to northwesterly direction, if you look at that and compare it to the Park Lane tornado, you can see we've verified all the way out at 150 degrees. Not just Park Lane, but at least one or two of the others were that far on that side of the wind rows. Now, maybe someday in the future, I'd kind of like to figure out what's going on up here, these, south to, these north to south moving tornadoes, maybe an idea for later to look at. As a result of this event, and some other events we had in 2000, uh, 2017, we did make some adjustments to policy. The first thing is, what do you do about local storm reports? Now, we want to be very careful when we send a local storm report during an event, because you don't want to send one out that says damage from a tornado, and then find out later it was actually straight line winds that caused this to occur. You can't really correct local storm reports. You can't really take them back. Once that, once that tornado report's out there, that red dot's going to show up on SPC's map for the rest of eternity. Can't get rid of it. But there are some circumstances where we do have high confidence that tornadoes were the cause of the damage. And when that's the case, we want our staff to know that it's okay to send tornado as the event type and go ahead with it. Cases like where you have photo or video evidence of the tornado, or if you have significant damage, like EF2 and higher type damage, if nothing else was going to cause, if you have a tornadic debris signature, detecting loft of debris on the radar, that would give you confidence as well. Or an environment like the one we were dealing with on May 24th, 2017. A tornado or nothing environment. An environment where you weren't getting wind damage. It was either tornado or nothing happened. Nothing happened at all. In those cases, we think it's okay. So how about another question? Can you make a tornado confirmation with a tornadic debris signature on the radar alone? And after talking with several other offices, the answer is no. The reason for that, you've got to have something on the ground to verify it. Whether it's photo or video evidence, or whether it's you've got survey damage, pictures of damage people have sent you, you need something on the ground in order to actually confirm a tornado. Tornadic debris signature alone doesn't cut it. And the last question, what do you do when you've got a case where uh, you have pictures and video of a tornado, but you don't have any damage? Well, certainly we can confirm a tornado in that case. We did with Harveysburg and Okta, two tornadoes that we did not observe any damage with, but obviously those tornadoes happened. So yes, we absolutely can make a confirmation in those kind of cases. The question is more, well, what rating do you assign a tornado with no damage? Because the enhanced for G scale is all about the damage you find. And so if there's no damage to survey, where do you put it on the enhanced Fujita scale? There's really no place to put it on the enhanced Fujita scale, so the best we can do is put it as enhanced Fujita unknown, or EFU for short. <laughs> I'm just going to end this on a classy note. Thank you for everybody for your attention. Thanks for having me. Seth, thank you for your help for getting this presentation put together. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right, well, we
we don't have enough time for a Q&A time, so um, we're going to go into our next presentation. Um, our fourth